Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends uh, in continuation to the previous discussion uh, on present movement in india uh, we try to keep in mind that uh, how present movement in india has grown and uh, we are basically trying to see under this heading present movement in india few case studies uh, which has been done with regard to the various resistance which has been in the countryside uh, of india and uh, keeping that particular thing in mind let us see that uh, we are here focusing upon uh, the key movements uh, which took place like uh, we try to speak about uh, the uh, discussion of uh, how uh, we have the tebhaga movement which we have discussed earlier in chapter uh, unit 10th and now uh, we are trying to take up another important uh, movement that took place uh, which is basically concerning the understanding of uh, present movements from a different perspective and uh, here we are trying to deal as uh, a important movement which is called as the Telangana movement and uh, this is basically uh, 11th uh, uh, chapter uh, in the discussion on present movement in India uh, which is falling under unit third in broader sense. And Telangana movement, if you try to see, I think uh, that is quite uh, impressive because uh, it was also in and around the time of independence that we try to see in the previous movement also that is the Tebhaga movement. Now regarding the Telangana movement, it is on the eve of independence from the British Empire in 1947. The Nizams of Hyderabad wanted it to remain independent under the special provision. However, the Hindus of the Hyderabad state who accounted for the majority of the population launched a joint India movement for the integration of the state with the rest of the country. The president of the state influenced by the communist party has also revolted against the Nizam who tries to suppress their armed struggles against the landlord and the present section will try to locate the genesis social condition and outcome of the movement uh, that is the Telangana movement. And basically uh, in this we are going to speak about uh, the socio-economic structure of the Hyderabad state in terms of what has made the movement in terms of genesis. We will try to see the early social reforms which took place with regard to the movements to give a shape and then uh, how these reforms has further led to the specific revolution and that is how we are trying to build up uh, this whole discussion uh, with regard to the Telangana movement. We have to not only understand the socio-economic structure of Hyderabad, we have also to see the revolution which took place in the state and what are the roles of different forces uh, in channelizing the movement uh, that becomes an important issue. So let us try to see that how and what made the Telangana movement and uh, what is the sociology behind that, uh, that is going to be an interesting issue. Basically we try to see that uh, Hyderabad which has been part and parcel of India but it has not been uh, in the previous time because it was basically under the uh, rules of Nawabs and that way if you try to see the Nizams were basically uh, ruling the uh, whole issue. And, uh, we try to see that there is and has been the world capitalistic system of which Hyderabad was an integral part. The Hyderabad economy was subject to the flow of the crisis of the world capitalistic system and their resolution. The specific link was the export of groundnut and castor from Telangana and cotton from Marathwara uh, which grew since the start of the century. This link imported the Great Depression into Hyderabad and led to a severe fall in the price culminating 
in the first crisis faced by the peasantry of Telangana as a result of which their indebtedness increased and they lost much of the land to the Deshmukhs. The Deshmukhs themselves wanted this land to cultivate the groundnut and craster which again became the remunerative after 1934. The second crisis came with the inflation and food shortage of the second world war period. It led to further indebtedness on the part of peasantry and further alienation of their land by the Deshmukhs uh, who used to cultivate the peanuts and castor uh, which has appreciated tremendously in the value due to the lubrication needs of the wearing Europe. This set the stage for the Telangana peasant uprising. So, we try to see that how uh, there was a shift from the uh, subsistence crop to the cash crops and uh, basically in order to give a supply to the outside world, uh, the people were being forced and they were into the trap of the Deshmukhs in order to uh, uh, supplement uh, the cash crops. Uh, they were under deep trouble and crisis and they have to uh, somewhere uh, gave off their land to the Deshmukhs. The capital had their counterparts in the rich peasants who resented the way the Deshmukhs concerned all the developmental infrastructure provided by the Nizam government. So, Deshmukhs were basically been uh, supported by the Nizam government and they were uh, that way going hand in hand with the government policies. They also resented the fact that they alone had to contribute to the grain levy collected by the state in the 1940s, whereas the Deshmukhs escaped the burden using their influence. They were therefore uh, fighting the Deshmukhs. Uh, they were basically trying to uh, fight the Deshmukhs and along came the communists to help them. Armed with the class collaborativist Stalin Mio theory of popular front, these included the this rural bourgeois in the front. Uh, which inevitably led to its failure. So, we try to see the sort of uh, uh, portray which has been generated how and why the things have happened. It is clear from the above facts that despite the structural constraints that traditional India has experienced a number of peasant uprising before and after independence. The communist led armed insurrection between 1946 to 1951 and in the, uh, in the Telangana region of the formerly princely state of Hyderabad certainly stands out as the most important one. The present ideological and the organizational split in the Communist Party of India can be tracked back to the difference in the thinking of the party leadership during the last phase of Telangana uprising. Today we find that the Communist Party divided into three distinct ideological camps. One is the Communist Party of India that is CPI. We have Communist Party of India Marxist that is CPIM and the Communist Party of India Marxist Leninist that is CPI ML. The view point of each of these groups has been presented in recent publications by the respective parties. The CPI consider the armed struggles in Telangana which took place after the accession of the state of Hyderabad to the Indian Union in the September 1948 as undesirable. The CPIM supports the continuation of the struggle after the accession as the partisans present struggle, but not as a liberation struggle against the Indian Union government led by the Congress party with the Nehru as the prime minister. The implication of the present movement for a strategy of rev revolutionary changes in India, the nature of Telangana present uprising the historical and the structural conditions which led to its growth and its consequences deserves the special sociological analysis. The present uprising forms the part of the several social movements in Telangana. Uh, Smelser, uh, Neil Smelser categorized social movement as being either norm oriented or value oriented, while the former are generally reformatory, the later are revolutionary in orientation. A norm oriented movement may in due course of time develop into the value oriented movement or the vice versa. At a particular point in a movement, a situation could develop which contains the element of both, which forms would subsequently become dominate 
and continue uh, would depends on the objective conditions on the one hand and the subjective feelings of the participants and the ideology put forth by the leaders on the other. In what follows the Telangana present movement which took place over the years from 1946 to 1951 is analyzed as a part of the different social movement and as such the nature and characteristics of each of the stage preceding and succeeding it are brought to light. Now let us try to see the socio-economic structure of the Hyderabad state because uh, this is going to be an important issue that what was the socio-economic structure of the Hyderabad state which has led to the ripening of this movement. The Hyderabad state one of the princely state before the independence and merged in India Indian Federation in 1948. The state of Hyderabad was ruled by Nizam a Muslim from around 1720. It was a multilingual state consisting of three linguistic areas uh, Telangana which is having eight districts, Marathwada having five districts and Karnataka having three districts. Uh, the Telangana region comprised almost half the area of the state. The Muslim lived in the urban areas including the city of Hyderabad owing to the influx of Muslims from other states in India and the process of proselytization of Harijans and other backward classes. The percentage of Muslims is estimated to have rise from 10% in 1901 to 14% in 1948. So I think there was high level of proselytization that is religious conversion which was taking place. The lower caste Hindus were basically converting themselves to Muslims uh, that was the phenomenon which was happening. Now let us try to understand what was the prevailing agrarian social structure in the Telangana. Uh, we try to see that agriculture was the main occupation of 85 percent of the population. The industrial growth was very little and 90 percent of the industries were owned by Muslims. There are two types of land tenure. Uh, one was the Khalsa which is normally called as the Rayatwari where the landlords were not called the owners but as the Patedars and Jagirs that is the Sarf e Khas including the Nizam crown land. So these are the two types of land tenures uh, which has been there. Uh, the condition of the was oppressive on the Jagirs land. The Jagirdars and their agents were free to extort from the actual cultivators a variety of illegal taxes. So there was Rayatwari on the one hand and then we have the Jagirdari on the other which is called as Sarfe Khas. So uh, if you try to see the Jagirdari system was seem to be more uh, uh, exploitative in nature. About 60 percent of the land in the states were under the Royadwari revenue system and the remaining 40 percent was under the direct control of Nizam. So you can understand the influence of Nizam uh, was very high. The overlord and the sub feudal lords were also part of uh, the 40 percent uh, including the Jagirdars and uh, Maktedars. Even in the non Jagirdari areas that is the uh, Khalsa land, almost every village was under the control of landlord which were locally called as the Deshmukhs and Deshpandes. So the landlords were Deshmukhs and the Deshpandes and the village who were seen as the village hereditary officials. Their influence permitted to, gar to garb land by frauds and which reduc reduced the actual cultivators to the status of tenant at will or the landless labor. The powerful Jagirdars and Deshmukhs were called as Durra meaning as the master of villages. The Durra tended to exploit occupational caste through the Veti system forcing a family customarily to cultivate land and to job uh, for do, to do job for the Deshmukhs. These landlords own the major portion of the land in the villages all this has given rise to the absentee land, landlordism and the oppressive system of the land tenure that is the Veti system. Of course, the conditions in the Jagidari areas were worse. While many Jagidars were Muslims, the landlords were mainly Hindus and mostly belonged to the Brahmins and the dominated agricultural caste such as the Redis and Velamas. It was estimated that between 1910 and 1940 the land alienation took place 
on the large scale and many cultivators became the tenant at will. The crop shares and the land uh, laborers also uh, were basically becoming uh, more and more worse. Side by side, owing to the increase in the cultivation of the commercial crop, the owner cultivator became rich. But during the period of economic depression that is 1929 to 1934 and for some times after the price situation was not favorable to the cultivators in general and to the small cultivators in particular. Around the second world war, the prices increased and this was an advantageous to the rich peasants but not to the poor. As the wages did not increase corresponding to the rise in the price, so the laborers were the uh, were affected adversely. In the countryside, the Jagidar landlords and the government officials were exploiting the people in number of ways. The Veti or the practice of the free and the forced labor was a vogue in the state of Hyderabad in general and in Telangana region in particular. Under the feudal system in each village, the service caste were granted partially rent free lands and the familial holdings that these lands were expected to serve the officials visiting the village for some nominal payment. But in practice, they were paid nothing and were treated no more than slaves. The Harijan leather workers, the washermen, the potters, the barbers, as also the carpenters and the blacksmiths serves the deshmukhs and the officials for no payment. Harijans virtually acted as the watchmen of the house of the Jagirdars deshmukhs and the village officials. This practice also enveloped the merchant who were expected to supply the provision of free of cost to the visiting officials. The Brahmin Purohit was also not exempted from the system of free services. There was another parallel system of Bhagela serfdom in Varangal and Nalgoda district with the Brahmin as the land owners followed by the Redis and the Kamas. So, these, uh, this is basically the agrarian social structure which was prevailing and we can see that uh, this uh, system was uh, uh, very taxing to uh, basically the lower caste and the lower class peoples. Uh, we also try to see that uh, the Brahmins uh, basically were having the supremacy in terms of control over the land and they were basically acting as the uh, landlords. Now, let us try to see what were the previous uh, reform movements uh, which has been there. So, let us try to understand the early social reform movements that took place in the region of Telangana. Uh, it is necessary to note that the early social movements in the state of Hyderabad originated in the city of Hyderabad which was part of Telangana region. In the initial stage, the movement were cultural and literary in character supported and led by the upper middle class Hindu intellectuals largely belonging to the Brahmin caste followed by the Redis. In the beginning of the 20th century, a Telugu literary movement was started and efforts were made to establish libraries in the different towns of Telangana. It was in 1901 that the first literary association that is Krishna Devarai Bhasha Nilayam was established in the city of Hyderabad under the leadership of K. Lakshmana Rao. A concerted effort however may, may be said to be made only in 1921 in the form of association called as the Andhra Jana Sangham. The objective of this association was the establishment of libraries, felicitation of Telugu Pandits, development of research in Telugu language and culture and spreading the education among the people. Influenced by the Indian National Congress and the various social reform movements then taking place in other states, the Sangham also included help to destitute as one of its objective. The development of the art was also one of its aim. The Sangham soon became uh, uh, important to take interest in abolition, uh, abolition of uh, social evils such as the system of forced labor that is the Veti system. The merchant also went into action and formed an association which demanded the abolition of uh, practice of free supply of provisions to government officials. The programs gave a spark to the reform movement in Telangana region in general 
and in the district of Nalgoda and Warangal in particular. In 1922, the two Telugu weeklies were also started. Thus, the Jana Sangham, which was started primarily as an association for the cultural development of Tel Telugu speaking people and as a protest against the domination of Urdu became an important social and cultural reform organization. As a reaction to this, the Muslim form an association called as the Majlis Itihad e Ul Muslim Mean. Its aim was to organize the Muslim as a united force against the Hindus and lend support to the Nizams of Hyderabad. Each Muslim declared himself as Anar Malik, meaning I am the head. The Telangana leaders in Hyderabad felt it necessary to intensify their, intensify their social reforms activities as also to spread the message to different parts of Telangana. In 1930, the Andhra Mahasabha was formed with the main purpose of educating the people against the forced labor, untouchability and other social evils and to impress upon the government the need for the abolition of such undesirable practices. The meeting of the Sabha concentrated on social evils such as parda, child marriage and the taboo on widow remarriage. They propagated the entry of Harijans into temples and requested the government to lift the prohibition of uh, cultural meetings, organization of uh, uh, Mahila Sabhas and exhibitions of physical exercises were the regular features of each of the Sabha meeting. The Andhra Jan Sangham slowly became defunct and its member joined the Andhra Mahasabha. M. Hanumanta Rao was moving spread behind the Mahasabha, Andhra Mahasabha. So we try to see that in the beginning, the Nizam government responded well to the demand of Andhra Mahasabha and issued order prohibiting the forced labor. However, these orders were never really implemented. Soon the Muslim organizations and the government came to suspect the motive of the reformers and began to create a number of hurdles in the functioning of Mahasabha. It became difficult for the Mahasabha to conduct the meetings every year. A section of the elite of the state of the Hyderabad revived the demand for equal rights for Hindus along with the Muslims and also for responsible representative government in the state. Accordingly, an organization called as the Nizam Subjects League was formed in 1935 and a number of nationalist Muslims joined it even though the government soon declared it as illegal. It was therefore given to the Andhra Mahasabha to take the lead. By this time, a number of middle class youths had joined the organization and they also felt the need for political reforms in the state. From 1938 onwards, uh, the important political development took place in the state in the quick succession. The Hyderabad State Congress was established and many from among the younger generation joined in this uh, initiative. The Nizam government objected to the name of organization and as it sounded like a state branch of the Indian National Congress. So, in, in 1945, there was two rival meetings of Andhra Mahasabha. One was held at Warangal and was attended by the non-communist. The other was held at Khamman and was attended by communists and their sympathizers. Both the groups discussed the problem of popular government, representation for different religious groups, problem of peasants and agricultural laborers. It must be noted that these were also the last important meetings of the two wings of Andhra Mahasabha. While the liberals slowly became a part of the state branch of Indian National Congress, the radicals joined the force with the Communist Party. Of course, within the Congress, there were two groups as well, one consisting of the liberal conservative and another was a progressive nationalist which was along the lines of the Indian National Congress. So, we try to see that uh, uh, in terms of uh, the so setting, in terms of uh, uh, the reforms, uh, initially the government was supporting the reform movements uh, which has been initiated for the well-being of the society, but gradually they suspected that uh, these movements sometimes can go against them. So, they try to stop or they try to put the hurdles in these uh, initiatives so that they can have a smooth uh, rule. Uh, within the region. Now, let us try to see that uh, uh, these reforms and the agrarian social structure, how ultimately it has led to the uh, coming of the Telangana present struggle. 
So let us now try to understand that present uh, Telangana present struggle uh, that was ranging from period 1947 to 1951. This movement was launched in the state of Andhra Pradesh against the former Nizam of Hyderabad. Agrarian social structure in the Nizam Hyderabad was of a feudal order. It has two kinds of land tenure as we discussed Rayadwari and Jagirdari. Under the Rayadwari system, the peasant owned the patta and were proprietors of the lands. They were registered, registered occupants. The actual cultivate, cultivators of the land were known as Sheikh Midars. Khalsa lands was chieftain's land and out of revenue collected from these lands, personal expenses of the royalties were met out. The Deshmukhs and the Deshpandes were the hereditary collectors of the revenue for the Khalsa villages. In Jagir villages, the tax was collected through the Jagirdars and their agents, both the Jagirdars and the Deshmukhs wielded the immense power at the local level. So, the region of Telangana was characterized by the feudal economy. The main commercial crops were basically groundnuts, tobacco and the castor seeds which were the monopoly of the land owning Brahmins. The rise of the reddies and the peasant proprietors further strengthened the high caste and proprietary class. The non-cultivating urban groups, mostly the Brahmins, Marwaris, Komtis and Muslims began to take interest in acquiring the land. Consequently, the peasant proprietor slided down to the status of tenant at will, sharecroppers and the landless laborers. So, in almost quarter of the 19th century till 19th, 1930, the depression led to the poor condition of the rich peasants. Also, later in 1939, the committee was appointed for investi investigating the conditions of tenure and later on in 1945, the Tenancy Act was passed in Telangana, uh, which was uh, having the increased discontent. Now, let us try to see what were the uh, main causes for the emergence of uh, the movement. Uh, the first is the Nizam's former uh, Hyderabad state has a feudal structure of administration. In the Jagir area, the agent of Jagirdars who were the middlemen collected the land taxes. They, uh, there was much of operation by the Jagirdars and, the, and his agents. They were free to extort from the actual cultivators a variety of taxes. This condition of exploitation remained in practice till the Jagadari system was abolished in 1949. On the other hand, the Khalsa land or the Rayatwari system was also exploitative uh, through the severity of exploitation in the Khalsa system which was little lesser. In the Khalsa village, the Deshmukhs and the Deshpandes worked as the intermediary. They were not in the payrolls of the Jagir administration. They were only given the percentage of the total land collections made by them. So, the Deshmukhs and the Deshpandes developed a habit to cheat the peasant by creating frauds in the land records. Thus, in countless instances, they reduced the actual cultivators to the status of tenant at will or the landless laborers. So, in both the system of administration, either it is the Jagir or the Khalsa, the peasants were exploited by the intermediaries appointed by the Nizam. High taxes, frauds and the records and exploitation resulted in creating the discontent among the poor peasants. Uh, second thing is, yet another cause of peasant movement in Telangana was the exploitation of the big peasants. Uh, D. N. Dhanagre, uh, who is a prominent sociologist, informs that the Jagirdars and the Deshmukhs had thousands of acres of land in their possession. The families of these big peasants and their heads were called Dudra, which we have said earlier also. It means the master of land, lord, master or lords of the village. Then Agri says that the Dora uh, or Dudra exploited the small peasants and agricultural laborers. This exploitation in course of time became legitimized by the big farmers. It was considered to be the privilege of Dora to exploit the masses of the peasant. And then Agri observes that such exaction has become somewhat legitimized by what was known as the Veti system, under which a landlord or a Deshmukh could force a family from among his customary retainers to cultivate his land and to do uh, one job or other, whether domestic, agricultural or official, as an obligation to the master. So, that was again an 
uh, exploitative system. The third reason for the emergence of uh, the Telangana uh, was a uh, revolt movement was in the former state of Nizam, a system of slavery, just like the Hali system of South Gujarat, Gujarat was prevalent. This system was known as the Bhagela. The Bhagela were drawn mostly from the aboriginal tribes who were tied to the master by debt. According to Bhagela system, the tenant who had taken loan from the landlord were of the debt is repaid. In most of the cases, the Bhagela was required to serve the landlord for generations. Uh, the fourth condition was the Redis and the Kamas uh, were the notable caste who traditionally worked as traders and money lenders. They exercised a great deal of influence in the countryside. They wanted to pull down the domina uh, dominance of Brahmins as a agriculturalist in the state. Uh, another factor is that the Telangana region was economically backward. The development of agriculture depended on the facilities of irrigation. The commercial crops could hardly be taken without irrigation facilities. Though the lack of irrigation was realized by Nizam and they provided the irrigation facilities to the peasant both in the Khalsa and the Jagir village, but these facilities were largely concerned by the big farmers only. Another important reason is the land alienation. Land alienation was not new to the former Hyderabad state. Between 1910 to 1940, the frequency of land disposition increased. On the one hand, the land possessed by the non-cultivating urban people, mostly Brahmins, Marwadis and the Muslims increased and on the other hand, the tribal peasants got reduced to the status of marginal farmers and the landless laborers. Describing the impact of land alienation on the poor peasants, D. N. Dhanagre has written, as a result of the growing land alienation, many actual culti uh, occupation, uh, occupations or cultivators were been reduced to the tenant at will sharecroppers or the landless laborers. In fact, where the rich patedars held holdings too large to manage, they tended to keep a certain amount of irrigated land to be cultivated with the help of hired labor and turned over most of their dry land either to bhagila serfs or to the tenant cultivators on very high produce tenants uh, rents. The Telangana peasant unrest did not erupt overnight. I think uh, these are the conditions uh, which has uh, made the Telangana peasant unrest to come into picture. It took about two, uh, three to four decades. Actually, till 1930, the poor condition of the peasant has reached, uh, reached its culmination. Meanwhile, there has been much transformation in the agricultural economy. The Telangana economy, which was only subsistence economy, had grown into market economy by 1940s. With the change in capitalistic agricultural uh, economy, there was no change in the status of tenant and sharecroppers. Actually, the mode of production and exchange remained pre-capitalist and or semi-feudal and emerged as a major source of discontent among the poor peasantry in Telangana. On the other hand, with the termination of the Second World War, there was a terrible fall in the wholesale price. The price stand uh, can strengthen the position of money lenders and traders who tightened their grip on indebted small patidars and the tenants. One of the bitter consequences of the force of change has been an increase in the number of agricultural laborers. It appears that there was enough discontent among the lower segment of peasantry. Peasants were only waiting for some opportunity to engineer some insurrections. The course of event that led to the Telangana peasant struggle can be described uh, as follows. The first thing is the Telangana peasant movement was engineered by the Communist Party of India that is CPI. It is said to be the revolution committed by the communist. The communist party started working in Telangana in 1936 between 1928 to 1933 Professor N. G. Ranga had laid down the regional level present organization in Telangana. This regional organization was affiliated to the All India Kisan Sabha, which is an organ of the CPI. Within a period of three to four years, uh, let, let us say by 1940, the CPI had established its roots in the former Hyderabad state. During the period from 1944 to 46, the communist activities increased in the several districts of Hyderabad. A proper framework was therefore prepared for launching a present movement in Telangana. 
the main issue was the abolition of VAT system, prevention of rack renting, eviction of tenants, reduction in taxes, revenue and rent, confirmation of the occupancy rights. These were certain issues which has been raised uh, in order to make the reforms in the country sites. The second important uh, uh, factor was the next event which took place in Hyderabad uh, was uh, actually in Telangana uh, that was the famine of 1946. All the crops failed and there was a crisis of avail availability of fodder. The price of the food, food, fodder and the necessities of life have increased. This was a crisis for the tenant and the sharecroppers. Actually in the year 1946 uh, which provided all opportunities for injuring the peasant struggle. In the early July 1946, the peasant resisted the government order and the militant action was taken by the CPI led peasants. So, that was another important issue uh, which has led to germination of the uh, uh, Telangana struggle. Then another reason is the CPI made an objective to mobilize the peasant. It looked up a, a campaign to uh, pro uh, propagate the demand of the lower peasants. By the middle of 1946, the communist propagate, uh, uh, propagate was fully intensified and covered around 300 to 400 villages under its influence. The movement during this period was slow, but peasant showed enough resistance uh, to the government dictates. However, it must be mentioned that the mobilization of peasantry, uh, only the Telangana local peasants participated in this uh, movement. And then we have another important uh, reason that is the second conference of the CPI was held in 19, March 1948. It resolved to give a revolutionary turn to the peasant movement in Telangana. The peasant later on were organized into an army and intermediary fought the guerrilla wars. Writing about this part of uh, the course of event, uh, Hamza, Alba, Hamza Alvi uh, has written, Telangana movement had a guerrilla army of around 5000 people. The peasant kills or drove out the land, landlords and the local bureaucrats and seized and distributed the land. They established the government of peasant Soviet which were integrated regionally into the control organizations. Peasant rule was established in an area of uh, 15,000 square miles with a population of 4 million. The government of the armed peasantry continued until 1950s. It was not finally crushed until the following year. Uh, the area remains one of the political stronghold of Communist Party. Uh, fifth point is, beside the present agitation, a parallel discontent was also taking place in Hyderabad. A para, uh, paramilitary voluntary force organized by Kazim Rizvi was taking its roots. The member of this voluntary organization were known as Razakars. This organization was against the present. The present consolidated their movement in the face of operation by of Nizam's activities of Razakars and the authority crisis in Hyderabad. Another important <coughs> issue was uh, on September 13, 1948, the Indian army marched into the Hyderabad and within less than a week of the Nizam's army, police and the Razakars surrendered without resistance. The police action take up the newly framed central government of independent India was very quick to suppress the present movement. D. N. Dhanagri has elaborated the police action as under. On India's part, the police action was taken to stop uh, Raskars uh, as they uh, not only created anarchic conditions within the state, but also posed a serious threat to the internal security of the neighboring Indian territories. The police action was therefore uh, unsavory but essential. Once the Razakars were overpowered and the military administration was set up, the offensive was immediately directed at the present rebels in the troubled district of Telangana. The superior Indian army spared no measures to suppress the communist squads. The peasant movement in Telangana had to be withdrawn uh, because of uh, these conditions. Actually, the police action gave a death blow to the communist led Telangana movement. In this struggle, the movement had to suffer a lot. Fighting with the Indian army over 2000 peasantry and the party workers were killed. By 19 August 1949, nearly 25,000 communists and active participants were arrested. By July 1950, the total number of detainees has reached to 10,000. 
this could uh, this should suffice as an index of intensity of Telangana peasant struggle. In Hyderabad, the Nizam that is the Muslim nobility wanted the state autonomy, whereas Hindu majority wanted that the state should have a merger to the India subcontinent. The authority crisis helped the communist in, in Telangana for the insurrection. Uh, the leftist strategy uh, in CPI by B. Ranadev and P. C. Joshi has given an ideological boost. So, in 1948, Indian army masked Hyderabad and Nizams has to surrender their Jagirs. Now, uh, if you try to see uh, uh, further details uh, with regard to the Telangana peasant movement, we try to see that the Telangana peasant movement continued for about 5 years and uh, uh, its outcome can be enumerated uh, in following ways. Uh, first thing that we could uh, uh, smell out is the struggle had the participation of the mixed class of peasantry, though the rich uh, peasants mainly the Brahmins had their involvement in the struggle. The major achievement was that the struggle for the first time brought together the tenants, sharecroppers and the landless laborers. This was by all means a very big achievement of the struggle. The Kamars and the Redis caste who belonged to the rich class of peasants uh, though gained enough but the movement consolidated the strength of the poor peasants, particularly the tribals who were the victims of the Veti uh, system that is the bonded labor. Second important thing which we can observe is uh, another benefit of this struggle was in favor of the communist party. The communists for a long time to come exercised their hegemony over the entire state of the Hyderabad uh, which they were not in a position to handle it down. Uh, third important thing is that though the communist party as a whole benefited from the Telangana peasant struggle, it had its own loss also. Ideologically the party got split from top to bottom. One group uh, of communists that supported the struggle while the other has tried denied it. The second group argued that the struggle was in no case less than terrorism. So, I think there was a split within the uh, communist party itself. Writing about the division of communist party during the struggle, P. Sundaraya has written that it is relevant to mention that during the course of struggle, particularly during the phase of its last two years, the communist party from top to bottom was sharply divided into two hostile camps, one defending the struggle, uh, peasant struggle that is the Telangana struggle and its achievement and the other denouncing and decrying it as terrorism. Those who opposed this struggle had even openly come out with the press, uh, providing uh, the uh, enemies in maligning the struggle and the communist party that was leading it was put into trouble. This sharp political ideological split. Uh, though en enveloping the entire party in the country was particularly sharp and acute in the Telangana region. So, I think that was another important reason for uh, the end of Telangana movement and also we try to see that uh, so far the demand of the poor agriculture classes were concerned the movement was a failure because they could not get much out of this. Surely, there were some gains to commerce and ready uh, the rich peasants. Uh, uh, but the gains of the poor peasants such as share coppers was quite meager, especially uh, the concern was to bring about the transformation uh, with regard to the Veti system and uh, with regard to giving the land rights to the people basically those who were tenant at will or those who were the cultivators. So, they could not gain much. So, virtually we try to see that uh, uh, we had uh, uh, many forms of exploitation which were still prevailing. The Telangana peasant struggle it must be boldly said was from above and not from the peasant themselves. So, we try to see that uh, uh, either it is the uh, national government uh, that is the Indian National Congress or sometimes it is the role of the military uh, which was prime, but uh, the uh, transformations which have been initiated even by CPI they have also split it. So, all these conditions has basically led to certain amount of decline uh, with regard to uh, the initiatives. Uh, which could have taken a different shape, but that did not happen. So, we can say that uh, no single agrarian stratum initiated the movement and uh, we try to see that uh, uh, the movement which has to come by one's own that is uh, through the leadership of uh, the so called uh, uh, exploited uh, that did not happen because most of the time they had a support from the communist party 
<coughs> sometimes we try to see that uh, uh, the sort of changes which has been brought about uh, these changes were basically happening because of uh, uh, the troublesome state. Uh, we try to see that uh, the Nizams versus the uh, <coughs> main government uh, that was one tussle which was going on. Uh, another important thing was the sort of reforms which has been initiated uh, which has been suppressed through time uh, that was another important uh, deadlock which has been there. And also we try to see that uh, the control by the Deshmukhs and the Deshpandes uh, which belong to the uh, <coughs> to the Brahmin and also the upper caste Hindus uh, they were also trying to maintain certain amount of status quo. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, which try to resist uh, the Telangana peasant struggle and uh, the struggle which should have come from the uh, <coughs> from one's own in terms of leadership by the uh, uh, by the peasant themselves I think that was not sharply visible and that way we try to see that uh, no agrarian statum initiated the movement uh, that we just shared. Uh, it was all the handiwork of the communist party uh, which was basically coming to the picture and once that communist party itself was uh, uh, fragmented in terms of uh, uh, one group trying to support the present struggle uh, in favor of uh, uh, bringing about the reforms. On the other hand, uh, one uh, ideological group of the communist party was trying to treat them as the terrorist. So, I think uh, there was a whole split uh, and the CPI would could have done much justice in terms of uh, coming as a constituted party could not do much appeal uh, to the peasant struggle especially uh, the interest has been diverted. So, we try to see that uh, uh, these are certain issues which has made uh, the Telangana peasant struggle to be weak uh, despite the failure stories of uh, all these tel Telangana struggle it must be admitted that it was a source of ins inspiration for the communist party as a whole in the country. Because we try to see that uh, the communist party uh, which was not seen as a visible national party uh, could gain a lot uh, from this Tel Telangana peasant struggle. We try to see that uh, the Telangana peasant struggle uh, was uh, an eye opener for uh, the communist because uh, through time uh, the Telangana uh, which has not been the representative region for the communist party uh, after the Telangana present struggle, uh, uh, de uh, the decline of the tel Telangana present struggle, we try to find out that uh, there was a uh, mutual gain uh, for the communist party of India. So, we try to see that uh, the deep roots of the communist party of India has been uh, uh, has, has took place. Uh, after the advent of the Telangana peasant struggle. So, one way although it was not uh, a favorable situation for the Telangana peasant itself, but we try to see that uh, it has uh, provided a lot of support uh, from the lower stratum as well uh, for the communist party of India. So, we try to see that communist party of India could have the strong uh, footing uh, basically after the gradual decline of the Telangana peasant struggle. And D. N. Danagre has uh, rightly made uh, it as a conclusive statement about the outcome of the movement when he says that the Telangana insurrection was no more uh, successful than the other peasants uh, resistance movement in India. Like all other movement, uh, the Telangana struggle has legends and inspiration for the radical left in India. Recently, there has been the renewed interest in the academia as well as in the politics in the study of Telangana struggle. Uh, its silver jubilee celebrated with all shades of communist party in India. However, an occasion for mutual mud slinging, uh, but that must be left out of this study uh, because that carries a, a political connotation. So, our concern is to see that what were the conditions which has basically led to the emergence of uh, this movement and what has made this movement uh, to come to a shape in terms of a strong struggle. We also try to see that uh, to what extent uh, the movement could gain much of its importance, but uh, we have to see that uh, the sort of changes which has been brought about in the Telangana region basically in terms of sharpening of the uh, identity uh, or sometimes uh, the decline of the Nizam in terms of the tyranny of Nizams. I think uh, these were the drastic structural changes which has taken place, but uh, how much it has paved the way for. Uh, the Telangana peasants, I think uh, that is going to be an important question. 
So, uh, we have to analyze the class composition and ideological foundation of the Telangana movement uh, in the different places or we have to see that uh, uh, we can construct uh, this particular thing in terms of the various phases. The antecedents and the consequences of the armed struggle has been noted. Uh, we try to see that uh, how things have been put differently. I think uh, we try to see that the present movement which has been led by the communist with a revolutionary ideology of the caste class struggle had to be seen in relation to the other movements uh, which has sprang in the different parts of Telangana in the beginning of the 20th century. And also we try to see the Telugu literary movement which introduced the idea of Renesa and was against the Nizam establishment that was also very successful. We try to see that uh, the sort of changes which were supposed to be brought about uh, through the reforms uh, because their basic concern was to fight against the tyranny of Nizams uh, that also has happened. Uh, so, I think uh, the reform initiatives which has been taken up uh, has been considered and uh, they try to bring out the overall change in the existing system. Uh, to some extent their concern was to fight against the social evils that was also uh, basically seen especially uh, they wanted to have certain amount of reforms with regard to uh, the agra agrarian uh, uh, structure uh, especially the vetti system which has to be overcome uh, in terms of uh, uh, the sort of discrimination which has been done for the lower caste. So, to some extent these issues has also taken place. So, ultimately we try to see that under the influence of the Indian National Congress and the Arya Samaji initiatives, the Telangana elites have given a new direction to the activities of Andhra Mahasabha in 1930s. So, virtually the Andhra Mahasabha which was acting as a uh, important uh, organization for bringing about the social reforms especially has uh, put lot many ground for uh, the ultimate uh, structuring of the society in a new way. And uh, definitely uh, through this uh, present movement uh, we try to see that uh, certain uh, tyrannies which could have been done uh, had been uh, gradually uh, uh, came off and we try to see that it has led to certain amount of structural change the sort of structural inequalities which has been there uh, that has been gradually uh, stopped. We try to see also that uh, the sort of structuring which has been there in terms of uh, uh, the sort of land inequalities that has been stopped. We try to see uh, the arrangements which have been there basically with regard to uh, how the two types of land uh, especially the Zagidari system uh, which was prevalent and sometimes we try to see that uh, the Khalisa land uh, practices which has been there by the Nizams. So, these exploited system has also uh, gradually uh, declined. So, we try to see that uh, these sorts of arrangements are going to be an important issue especially the sort of reforms which are internally managed. But uh, one uh, shortcomings which we try to see in terms of Telangana uh, present struggle is that uh, there should have been some leadership which should, which should have come from the present themselves, but uh, they always get their support from the communist party. Uh, sometimes they had a support from the Andhra Mahasabha leadership, but their own leadership was missing and that of course is one important reason uh, which could not make the te <coughs> Telangana present struggle to sustain uh, once the things have been reformed uh, at a wider level. So, virtually we try to see that the sort of tyranny which has been there in the countryside has gradually declined uh, uh, with the decline or the change of the leadership in terms of the ruler. And we try to see that ending of Nizam has gradually uh, made a great, uh, shift with regard to the agrarian social structure also and that is one way in which we can see uh, the whole debate. Uh, the sort of mobilization uh, which we try to see in terms of uh, the mobilization of the masses for the abolition of the forced labor uh, which is done through the Vetti system uh, which was seen as one of the uh, exploitative system. We also have uh, talked about uh, the sort of uh, Bagela serfdom which was again seen as a uh, system of exploitation basically uh, the tribal uh, who were basically encroached and have been made uh, forced labor <coughs> also has been a problematic issue. And also the issue of untouchability. Uh, between the upper caste and the lower caste and many other social evils uh, have taken together into consideration uh, through this particular Telangana present struggle. 
So, what will we try to see that uh, uh, these reforms have gradually led to uh, the <coughs> wider reforms, uh, especially we try to see that uh, they have there was a demand for the equal education and the economic opportunities, uh, the change of occupations, all these things have been quite significant. Basically, when we try to see the changes uh, which have taken place, I think uh, the Telangana present struggle uh, which was not uh, ultimately made for uh, bringing about the transformation uh, for the present struggle, but to a greater extent we can say that it has led to an overall uh, what you can say change in the existing structure and as we have suggested earlier also that it was basically a change which had been from the top uh, to bottom and uh, what I am projecting of course, is that uh, things could have been better if the Telangana peasant struggle could have rooted from uh, bottom to top uh, that is the leadership uh, within the peasantry uh, could have taken uh, good initiatives and they could have come in terms of leadership to bring about the reforms that did not happen and that is why the sustainability of this uh, Telangana uh, peasant struggle could not be uh, done uh, <coughs> much in terms of the time frame and that is how we try to see that uh, the gradual decline is because of the resultant of uh, the change in the rule uh, which has taken place. So, we try to see that uh, overall we have uh, uh, many contradictory uh, instances uh, like the uh, shrinking of the CPI in terms of uh, the specific ideology that started taking place. We also try to see that uh, the bigger reforms uh, which has been initiated to bring about certain amount of glory to the Telangana region in terms of the reforms that has been initiated by uh, the different people. So, I think uh, these are certain things which has made uh, this movement to be more practical and more viable. Uh, we try to see that uh, Telangana peasant struggle is uh, not uh, a specific uh, case uh, which is basically concerned with uh, uh, what one can say uh, bringing about the drastic change in the land tenure system, especially the Rayadwari system that is the Khalsa system or the Jagirdari system that is the Surfe Khas. I think these things have been uh, eroded, rule has ended in the so called uh, Telangana region, uh, made the things uh, uh, more uh, fruitful and this particular Telangana movement has took place because of the change and uh, that is how we try to see that uh, the contribution of uh, uh, the, the Dura, I think they have gradually uh, uh, tried to shrink which were they were doing earlier uh, through the Veti system that uh, Mahasabhas has also come into the picture in terms of certain reforms which were basically practicing for bringing about the reforms. I think uh, the things uh, more prime uh, with regard to the agrarian what is required is that uh, we have to see that how and to what extent the uh, Telangana rural masses could have come. Uh, could not be seen very sharply. Uh, so, I think uh, to take into consideration, I think uh, we have to see we have to see also that how uh, we can speak up uh, what you can say uh, the bigger issues in terms of uh, uh, is the national uh, uh, ad against the nation. Uh, we vis a vis the Nizam's rule and how are uh, the princely state uh, by the central rule. So, I think uh, these are certain be more appealing and that is why I think uh, this movement uh, had it was uh, seen as one of the case study in terms of bringing about transformation side. And I think uh, for further readings uh, if you want to have further one can read in detail uh, from D. N. Dhanagre's contribution in 19 India, which gives a detailed analysis of uh, the Telangana that one can read for further studies. Uh, parallelly, we have uh, MS 
movement in India, which basically tries to speak about uh, uh, these issues. There are certain things uh, which we have to make it uh, uh, handy for further particular movement. So friends, uh, with these uh, things, uh, I will try to just uh, bind up my discussion. Further uh, movements, uh, present movements in the later discussions. So thank you to all of you.